Yeah, you can tell amongst us uh, who who goes outside and who does not. I've been trying uh, to. I've been trying to not be as pale and pasty on camera as I am in the 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 uh, the PowerPoint art of us. It's like, <laughs> am I getting there yet? Do I have anything? Oh, jeez. Well, folks, feel free to get your questions in. You can ask anything you want over in the questions pane and go to webinar. We go through first come, first serve, and uh, staggeringly, and whenever the questions are up, we're done. We walk out of here. We go eat ham sandwiches. What's it called? A Cuban Cuban sandwich? God, I miss Cuban Cubano? sandwiches. Ham and turkey? Cubano, yes. Yes. And no, no, no. Me neither, no, Che. Yeah. Oh, so good. Oh, I'm so hungry. When we're done here, I'm going to the gym. Cause that's are you really? Today. Yeah. Oh. I have no other chance today. Oh, you got a client today? No. You should... I'm with no. You. You're... Oh, yeah. Well, you could go. You could go <laughs> later if you wanted. You're not in this. No. Afternoon. No. If I if I go later, you know what happens? I end up waiting an hour and a half for like one of oh, wow. four pieces of equipment that I want to use because all the like after work normal people get out and want to do asinine things on the important equipment. Do dips in a squat rack. And I'm like, what? What's yeah. the point of you? <laughs> I, th I, was, I thought for sure you were going to say rower. You know, do rowing or yeah, 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 lots of rowering. <laughs> or the or what's the aerobicycle? <laughs> Jazzercise. <'cause... laughs> That's what you want the knee pads for. Yes, jazzercise. That goes so well with the with the shoulder pads. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do flash like dance for this year. Holiday cards. All right, Donna asks, should SQL Server run under the local system account, an Active Directory account, or NT Authority network service? What's the best practice or uh, easiest to support? I always went with the service account. Uh, I liked being able to control permissions to places outside of the SQL Server. I like to very specifically have my service account inherit service accounts inherit certain permissions, so like well, either lock pages in memory or perform volume maintenance tasks. But uh, really, aside from that, you know, if, if you're not doing anything crazy and, you know, you find yourself spending more time creating different service accounts and trying to figure out what to do with them, then just use the local ones. But if you have a need for, you know, going, going places outside of the SQL Server or assigning specific permissions, I really like the service account better. Yeah, I'm the same way. Mark says, afternoon, y'all. I'm investigating mm. blocking caused by the change tracking cleanup process. Oof. Running on some heavily updated tables during production hours. My thinking is to turn off auto cleanup and manually clean by looping through the tables using the uh, documented stored procedure SP flush CT internal table. On I really wish you had read this before you started reading it out loud. <laughs> I, and even even our transcription is just like, yeah. what the heck did you just say? No. <laughs> Note to transcriptionist, I apologize for that. You don't have to get it right. It doesn't matter. We wish we wouldn't have read the question. We're all full of regret at this point. Our, our, trans, uh, our transcriptionist has became an anti-Putin blogger to have a more safe line of work. <laughs> 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 what just happened? <laughs> uh, Mark, I don't think any of us have ever used change tracking. I don't even think that... I don't think, am I missing out? Richie, have you ever used it? You've never used it either, right? Nope. He's got, his video either froze or he's yeah. shocked with horror. He might Still. be shocked with horror. Yeah. Frozen in now, time. Now at this point, we uh, should like make Miami jokes. I'm having a party. <laughs> Our poor transcriptionist. Um, Richie, I love Mexico. What could I say that would shock him and make him move? <laughs> no, he did disappear. Uh, it was his internet. Here in crime-free Brooklyn. Uh, no, Mark, I don't... Go on forever. Oh, my gosh. Mark says in testing, it takes upwards of six hours to complete. Um, I would I would actually open a support case. I would open a support case of Microsoft because I think it's probably going to be the cheapest way to get that answer, or I would post it on Stack Overflow only because... Man, I'm totally going to mute, uh, mute yeah. if I can figure yeah. out how. There it goes. Okay. Um, it's a, I would post it on dba.stackexchange.com just because that way I think there's other people out there using change tracking. I don't have an anti-change tracking field. It's totally fine. Just never run into people using it, so you got me there. Yeah, you know, I think you know, just like from having read some change tracking questions on 
Stack Exchange. I'm at least like sort of sure that like you can index tables differently to oh. help that help these processes along. So I would I would ask there, open up a, a thing with Microsoft if you have support with them and go with that. Let's start from there. I would, we just don't use it enough to be terribly helpful with that. That totally makes sense. Uh, and it looks like the slide deck froze on Drew Fergewell too. I'm like, oh, well, let, me, let me move that a little. All right, there he goes. <laughs> Everything is frozen today. <laughs> Richie had a full screen, according to. We we should. Uh, I wish I had a way to easily show you guys a screenshot of Richie's blue screen. But blue sc- <laughs> Richie also has more computers probably than any of us. More laptops. Yes. More of this gear, but. None of them work for length. This is why, if you ever wonder why it takes so long time for us to get software out, it's not because Richie's not a good developer. He's a great no. developer. His machines just keep blue screen. It's those damn Windows developers. It's <laughs> ruining everything for him. Can't cloud. get those audio drivers synced up. Oh, God, I forgot about that. Uh, Joe asks, what happens when an index is disabled? Joe's probably our favorite name, too. Uh, we yes. know a lot of good Joes. What happens when an index is disabled? Is there any overhead, or is it taking up space on disk? Nah, man. You disable that index. I mean, you do have to be careful, because there is some locking involved when you do the disable. But it'll deallocate all the pages that were associated with it, and you just keep the definition of the index in Object Explorer, or you know, in, C- in SQL Server stuff, it'll show up as a disabled index. Uh, m- makes life pretty easy if you disable something that you wanted to keep. Uh, you can just kind of right-click and hit rebuild and have it come back to life. Uh, you do have to be careful, though, if you're using maintenance plans to do any sort of indexy stuff on your servers. They will re-enable disabled indexes for you without asking. So fun stuff there. Uh, but aside from that, no, not really any overhead. I could not believe it when when I first ran into that. Somebody's told us that yeah, if you ena- or if you run maintenance plans, it enables disabled indexes. And I thought there is no way maintenance plans can suck that bad. I don't yeah, like I- maintenance plans, but Wow, they do suck that bad. You, you know, the stuff you run into like that that just makes you like lose your damn mind. <laughs> like, I was like, now I have to know this. I have to remember this. I just forgot someone important's birthday because now I have to remember this thing about maintenance plans. Like that part of my brain just went. Oh. Erica asked me yesterday. She's like, "How old are your parents?" I'm like, "I have no idea. I have okay. No idea." Nope. Like, well, what what birth year are they? No clue. Yeah. Do you know their birth dates? Mom's in February, Dad's in June. I just no clue. Yeah. But I can tell you all about the AK page structure, <laughs> like everything else. <laughs> Maintenance plans. Pablo asks, my prod and QA servers have different storage, and my dev team doesn't care. He says they say when they develop stuff, don't worry, it'll be faster on production anyway. How do I measure? And and I'm gonna change what he asks to make it make more sense. How should my development team measure their queries to know whether or not they're going to be fast in production? Uh, I would disregard disk almost entirely, and I would focus on how they. Uh, I would I would focus on making sure that I have enough RAM so that whatever whatever the disk subsystem is, I'm not spending a lot of time touching it when my queries run. Cool. Uh, next up, Steve asks, "Do you have any tips? Oh, do we ever?" Uh, for overcoming the, sometimes. <laughs> uh, for overcoming the version mismatch issues between management studio and integration services. Oh, that's so terrible. I no, I still have not. I still don't know how to open SSIS. So no. I, I all what I had to do as a database administrator, and this is going back years ago, but I had to maintain different VMs with different versions of Management Studio so that I could go open up different uh, integration services oh, packages. Yeah. Oh yeah, because yeah. like maintenance plans from one to the other would just be like, we can't figure this out. <laughs> yeah, it sucked so bad. Uh, yeah, and these days, with stuff. the fast, furious releases of SSMS, I'm kind of even more interested in that because they brought out stuff that breaks functionality, and they're like, we'll ship a fix soon. And I'm like, yeah, but yeah. I need to create a table today. Yeah, 17.8.1 is now available. So. Which tells you something in the Agile. <laughs> and it's not that I want it to go back to only updating every service pack. I like no. where they're going, but Same. There's, there's a mix in between those two. You know, and I, I, I understand the pain of, you know, frequent release cycles. I, I've had less than perfect first responder kit releases. There's been some weird stuff that's <laughs> gone on in there. So, you know, I'm like, I don't I don't pretend to be totally guilt-free perfect. and, like, innocent with the, with the whole thing. But 
you know, I'm, I'm one person testing against like a limited amount of stuff. I would hope that with Microsoft's, you know, like nearly unlimited financial resources, they'd have some like case sensitive instances to pick stuff up against. I don't know. Little things. Little uh, things. Or, and you would also hope that like the people who are, are managing Azure in house would dog food first. You Microsoft yeah. keeps talking, yeah. everything you, we give you, we've already been using for months up in the cloud, and then they ship an SSMS that doesn't work with Azure SQL DB. I'm like, yeah. what? It's what are they using up there? I don't, yeah. I don't know. It's strange to me. Joe asks, we seem to experience deadlocks during long-running CPU-intensive processes, like stuff that takes 15 minutes or more. Is there a relation between deadlocks and long-running processes? I mean, you when you have a long-running process, you kind of you tend to increase the likelihood of hitting a locking or deadlocking scenario, uh, especially if those long-running processes are crammed inside a begin train or whatever. Uh, you know, usually when we we talk to people who have these problems, like the three most common solutions are to either like make sure you have the right indexes in place to make these things fast, maybe batch your modifications so that you're not, you know, spending a long time getting a ton of locks, trying to escalate locks, all that other stuff. Uh, like, you know, batch size of like a thousand or less for your modifications. Uh, if you can, maybe like invest, like look at an optimistic isolation level like RCSI or snapshot isolation if you just want to like have certain queries, you know, uh, not knock against each other for readers and writers. There's a lot of options to kind of like make your life a little bit easier when you uh, have long running processes, but, you know, the obviously the first goal is to have good indexes is to make sure that like, you know, we have processes that run as quickly as possible before we go jumping into other things that are a little bit more rocket science-y. Yeah. And a link we always point people to, Michael J. Swartz, take care when scripting batches, talking about how you do work in smaller chunks. I also want to throw a plug out for Eric's excellent SP Blitz lock. Oh, this thing is awesome. Uh, so I'm going to fire open uh, SQL Server Management Studio. I don't have a deadlock uh, already <laughs> in here, so we'll see if I don't think I'm going to be able to. Uh, I've got a script real quick where we'll go and create one just because we got time on here, and I love you people. Deadlocks yeah, are fun. Why not? Spend time so I'm going to say, <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's finally even us on camera time together. I love you, man. <laughs> so SP Blitz lock. We'll go through and look at the system health session in order to see if any deadlocks have happened recently, what queries were involved. So right now I just ran it and it doesn't show any results. So let's fix that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go get out a query that I'm going to be running later uh, this week on a uh, <laughs> training class, actually. Now, if you, if you have an extended event session that is capturing deadlock XML, you can also point Blitz lock at that. You don't have to just use the system health one. If you have a specific monitoring for it, you can go look at that, too. So over on the left-hand side, and I'll switch into the uh, Stack Overflow database just because I don't like doing things in master. Mm -hmm. So over on the left-hand side, I'm going to start by creating a couple of tables. I'm going to create lefty and righty. They both have just a few rows in them. They both have a primary clustered key. So lefty and righty both exist right now. Over in the left-hand side window, I'm going to start a transaction, and I'm going to lock lefty. So lefty is now locked in the left-hand side because I didn't commit yet. All I did was begin the transaction. But it feels like someone else did. But it feels like someone else left. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, I don't know how many of our audience is going to get that, but I was particularly proud that I got it. <laughs> you, you, you'll know by the amount of people that drop off the call. That's <laughs> <laughs> These people have no, what are they talking about? Adolf Garlic, what? <laughs> Uh, yeah. so, so over on the left hand side, lefty is locked. Over on the right hand side, righty is locked. And everything works fine here so far. They can both hold locks on two separate tables. Now over on the left hand side, I'm going to go through and try and update righty and it won't work. Because right now over on the right hand side, righty has already gotten his uh, query, uh, or on the right hand side, righty's already locked. So on the left hand side, this guy's blocked. There's no timing for blockouts or blocking by default on SQL Server. By default, blocking can go on forever. But I'm going to do something on the right-hand side, and things are about to happen real fast. So I'm going to explain what happens before it happens. On the right-hand side, I'm going to try to update lefty 
Now at this point, the left-hand window is waiting for stuff on the right. The right-hand window is waiting for stuff on the left. It's exactly like the reservoir dog scene from uh, from uh, within the garage where they're all pointing guns at each other and the mafia and all that good stuff from Stack Overflow. So when I hit execute on this right-hand side, within five seconds, SQL Server is going to all of a sudden wake up and decide to kill one of these transactions. It decides to classically kill the one that's the easiest to roll back. In this case, they're both roughly the same. The one on the right was chosen to die because he hadn't done any work yet, whereas the one on the left had updated both tables. So we had a deadlock. Transaction was deadlocked. Try to rerun your query. Ah, screw that. What we're going to do is we're going to go look keep at that SP. Up. Sometimes the first lock doesn't end up. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. You're probably yeah. right. Look at that. Oh! Oh, no, look at you. Um, so let's try it again. Right side. Uh, so let's go update. Begin Those, I kept running into that when I was writing Blitzlock. Where I'd be like, okay, clear things out, start fresh, deadlock. Where's the dead? <laughs> Where is it? Like, <laughs> Please work this time. No, still. Uh, all right. So begin tran. Begin tran. Update. Update. Oh, did he not? Oh, he's still executing. Oh, hold on. Roll back. Oh, <laughs> it's going to be all kinds of fun. Roll back. People are that. like, I just wanted to get my tri my question answered, and I had to sit through and watch them <laughs> herp -a derp through one deadlock after another. <laughs> update. Update. Who's it going to be? And... Who's it going to be? It's all exciting. Ah! SP Blitz Lock. There we Man, go. That Look at that. Good. That felt uh, good. Do you wish to commit these transactions? Hold on. Cancel rollback. It's Richie Rump, ladies and gentlemen. So forget everything we just said in the last five minutes. Yeah, we lied. Uh, so now what SP Blitzlock shows you is here are the queries. Here's deadlock number one. Here's deadlock number two. Shows you who the winner was, who the victim was. You can see from DBCC input buffer type stuff. Or, and here's the exact queries that are involved. Here are the object names that are involved in the block. Here's the query that was involved, or here's the uh, the application that's involved. One of my favorite things is that you can see, because people are like, oh, I swear I'm only running everything in no lock with read committed snapshot isolation or whatever, un read uncommitted. You can see right here what's going on. Then he's got a really nice summary grid down here where you can get more information about the queries that were involved, run SP Blitz index to see which indexes are missing, all kinds of fun stuff. If you scroll a little bit to the right, one of, one of, one of our uh, new contributors uh, added the entire XML deadlock graph. Uh, Joshua Darnell added that in a recent thing. So if you need to go send that off to someone else, you can go just copy and paste it from right over there. Or if you uh, if you um, want to show it in SQL Century Plan Explorer, yeah, yeah, visualization yeah. of deadlocks, Anything copy paste it into there. It. It's your the deadlock. The world is Crazy. your oyster. Your terrible smelling oyster. <laughs> Let's see. So next question. Jim says, hi, guys. We've been using 2017 read scale availability groups without a Windows cluster. We thought we'd be able to do backups on our secondaries, but our secondaries are never detected as a preferred backup replica. Yeah, no, you don't want to do that. Um, is that a limitation of clusterless read scale availability groups? I, I don't know if it's a limitation of it documented or not. I'm just a huge fan of only running backups on a primary. In our senior DBA class, we talk about why. So. Unfortunately, no dice. Paul asks, I'm creating log shipping across two separate domains. What would be the best way to set up the service account that will run the log shipping process? Well, <laughs> I've never done it across domains. I'm not even sure where to, where, to, where to begin looking for issues with that. Well, I just wouldn't. I, 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 I mean, you can do the log shipping, but they don't need to be ser identical service accounts. You know, like er earlier, Eric goes, just make sure that they're service accounts so that you can designate those service account permissions on the file share where the backups are going to be. But that's uh, that's all you should have to deal with. They shouldn't be directly talking to each other at all. Should put in a plug for SP all night log too, but then I'm not going to demo one more thing inside this session. That's about where I draw. <laughs> and now we have this server over here. No, we don't. <laughs> Uh, Marcy asks, I love y'all's posts why multiple plans for one query are bad. Have you seen any success with dynamic shops using either optimize for ad hoc or force parameterization? We have a query with over a thousand plans. It's not too terrible, but which option should we try? Hmm. 
uh, whichever one you can support, I guess. Uh, I'm a big fan of, so like, there, there are sometimes I'm like, I'm working with a client, and I'm like, look, you have like these three options to fix, par fix parameter sniffing. Which one are you most likely to go with, and which one puts your server in the least amount of danger? And any single one of those can be a reasonable solution in a, in like, in a certain set of circumstances. So like, if you have a query that doesn't run very often, and it's just always going to be weird and different, and you know you don't have anyone sitting there checking out the plan cache, monitoring stuff, throw a recompile hint on it. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to yell at you. It's probably not going to do anything too awful to your server. You know, uh, it really just kind of depends on your situation and you know the, the kind of like the amount of time and effort you have to fix things. If you really want to spend a lot of time and dig deep and you know fix queries and indexes and try rewrites and temp tables and CTs and whatever else, go go ahead. Uh, but you know, generally, it, it falls upon the person who has to support it long term to decide which thing works best for them. Josh says, if you stop and restart the system uh, extended events session, you'll get results in Blitzlock. That's not a bad idea, too, but I'm of the bang my head against the wall repeatedly until the stuff comes out. I'm all about that. Oh, my God, Paul. Paul asks... The developers at my job, and the, what they, they need to spend more time hanging out with Richie, the developers at my job want to disable table lock escalation to alleviate locks during large data processing sessions. Is this a good practice? If not, why? No. Uh, so <laughs> uh, lock escalation is a cheeky monkey, and it's going to have, and SQL Server does it for a good reason, right? Like you, you can only, like SQL Server only has so much memory that it's going to give out for locks. And when a query is, you know, when SQL Server is like, oh, this query is going to need, you know, five, ten, fifteen thousand page or row locks, I'm going to try to get, a, I'm going to try to get this table level lock, to just lock to one object. You don't want that much memory being overcommitted to locks. You don't want SQL Server like waiting to get memory to give out to locks. You don't want any of that stuff happening. That's a generally pretty bad idea. Uh, if you are having that much trouble with with locking on in this situation, this is what partitioning is for. It's like you know, it's not the magic performance feature that a lot of people think it is. It is exactly like exactly for stuff like this. It's a data data management feature, so you can easily work on a single partition, swap partitions in and out without killing your, without killing concurrency too badly. I also worry about you know we just demo deadlocks. What happens if you have say five, ten, a hundred thousand locks pending against two different sessions, and then they want to start stepping on each other, and you run into yep. a deadlock? Holy cow! The rollbacks are going to suck. The rollbacks yep. will just be terrible, just absolutely yeah. awful. And you know even for uh, with partitioning, like you know Microsoft came, mm -hmm. uh, when they when they, when that came around, they uh, they brought out a new lock escalation level, which was auto, which would only lock, would only escalate locks from row or page to a partition. And even, even, even in there, there's a big, like, bold note in the release was like, this may cause deadlocks in certain scenarios if you're doing it, like, you know, if these partitioning queries start stepping on each other's partitions. So it's not, you know, there's no such thing as a free lock, no matter, <laughs> no matter how you take it. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Srijith asks, uh, upgrade question, what year will Richie's t-shirt stars get upgraded from four stars to five stars? Not this year. We'll just put it that way. So for those who don't know, uh, that's for each World Cup that a team has won. Uh, every team that has won the World Cup has puts a star on there, except Uruguay. Uruguay has won two World Cups. They have four stars. So How do they do that? They're special. Well, because they count their Olympic wins in there, which nobody else does. Oh, it's cheating. It's cheating. It's cheating. Yeah. Well, thanks so everybody be... for hanging. Oh. Thanks everybody for hanging out with us this year. Now we're gonna go all go off and uh, watch. I almost said America's Cup, but World Cup. There ain't no America this year. <laughs> America's Cup sailing, and there ain't there ain't none of that. This no Americans sailing away. All right. Thanks everybody, and uh, see y'all at the next week's office hours. Adios. Bye bye.